Today's episode is sponsored by DistroKid and I'll have more about them later on in the episode. My next guest is a Canadian-born multi-instrumentalist. A terrific producer and wonderfully emotive songwriter. Usually I hate when no words in every song Talk about a sweet love I haven't felt in so long This is Emily Kruger. She has a vision to inspire listeners to look behind the veil of their creativity. And with over 270,000 followers on Instagram and TikTok for her iconic guitar compositions, Emily is beginning a new chapter. In this episode, she talks to me about her new alias, Velvetica, an indie psychedelic project with elements of soul, and how she found a spiritual higher power in the darkness. Please enjoy this episode. We always tend to shy away from the struggles mm. that get us here and all the things that don't seem, you know, glamorous. Yeah, we just try and push it down. And then we're on social media yeah. like... I just woke up like this. This is this is yeah. what happened all along. And it and it's never like that. You know, it's you always see the artist on their rise when mm. they're like here. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, like they want to make it look like it happened overnight. Mm -hmm. And like mm -hmm. that's pretty toxic as an industry, hey, where Absolutely. really most of the time it's years and years and years and years. X amount of years, setbacks, failures, you know, long nights blood, sweat, and tears, and then someone yeah. says, wow, you blew up almost overnight, and it's probably the most frustrating for us creatives to hear. Right. You're like, I've been doing right. this for so long. That's also not even the point. Like, the whole point is just to make art. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And there's this whole concept of, like, making it. We're like, we're already making the art. Yeah, what even is that? <laughs> Emily Kruger, welcome to the Inspired By podcast. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm doing great. Doing really, really Pleased great. To hear it. it's, it's bright and early here in LA. It's like I know. Good morning. So. Thank you yeah. for that. I still, I still have my coffee here. We're getting going. Perfect. I'm <laughs> on my third cup, so I might get the jitters towards the end of oh, this episode. Oh, I love it. Nobody panic. Third cup in the <laughs> evening. Way to go. I do this thing every day that is like, I have the first cup. I'm feeling good. And I'm like, this is the space that I want to be in. And there's yeah. this little, I'm not sure who it is, but there's this little voice in the back of my head that says, now you just go about your day, at, at, you know, <laughs> and focus on the tasks that you have set. There's another little voice that tends to win that says, it'd be really good if you just had another cup of coffee. <laughs> and I always fight with these two because I know that second cup is going to give me all of the anxiety that I don't want. And so far, right. Only the negative voice wins. Every single day I have that second or third cup. And then at the end of the day, I'm like, oh, I can't sleep. And I feel nervous about everything <laughs> yeah. that I did when I was a kid. You know, So we'll see how we go. Yeah. You might have to coach me through this episode. I'm on the same wave. I'm trying to taper back coffee and like get myself unaddicted to sleep supplements. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I honestly think I'm addicted to sleep supplements because coffee i mean i'm doing a better job now but i used to be like a three four cup a oh, day yeah. type gal oh, yeah. and then I, I assumed my adrenals were really suffering so i decided to taper back a little bit but oh, dude i'm so proud of you alas well done. we're on cup two at 8 a.m <laughs> we'll, we'll be at 1 p.m <laughs> so um please plug promote uh whatever you have coming mm -hmm. up and and where everybody can can find your your music as of right now i'm kind of in between a transition with the old content mm -hmm. and the old version of Emily Kruger and the new version, which is coming out um, actually July 17th. Um, I'm releasing my first single under Velvetica and that's the new name. And Amazing. it's a whole new project. It's a whole new journey. It's a whole new universe and side of me that no one's really seen and it's interesting, I say side of me, but it's actually, it's the first time that I'm giving all of me okay, and actually showing who I really am as an artist. And as, not only just as an artist, but as a human being mm -hmm. with a soul, with a purpose on earth. And like, I will, I will preface by saying that I'm a, I'm a deeply spiritual person and that's never really came through in my music. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so now it's it's definitely in there, okay. which is great. And there's Terrific. a lot of themes of consciousness and evolution. And it's it's all the good stuff that make us up as humans. Wow. So we've got a little bit to unpack in terms of how we how we got to this exciting moment. Yeah. Why don't you kick things off by telling us maybe the starting chapters? I believe you came up in Canada, but what were those first like musical steps for you? What were the influences? When did you first mm. pick up the guitar? Even if it was that even your first mm-hmm. instrument? I mean, music was always in me. I think one of the most beautiful things is my mother such a sweet, sweet woman. She would write these letters um, when we were like infants, when we were one years old, one year old, um, maybe three, five, at any, any any time in our life, really. But she sent me a letter that she wrote when I was, I think, like under two years old. I couldn't speak yet. And she wrote this really sweet letter about me, about my personality, and about all of the types of, th- types of things that I would do as a little baby. And one thing that was so sweet that she wrote in there was that I was humming before I would even speak. So I was always singing. So like even before I was speaking, I was singing and I was humming and melodies were clearly, I guess, apparently in my head at that time. <laughs> is, is, is your mom writing these letters for you when you turn 18? Does she give them to you when, you, when you're a kid? Like, is it something you kept? Did you keep, I assume you kept it. She keeps it. Oh, yeah, okay. she has it. I've, I've been a little bit too nomadic to keep so many keepsakes like that, mm-hmm. but she keeps these. Okay. Um, mostly it happened when we were younger, mm-hmm. but I just, that's such a sweet sentiment to do. And it's really neat to be able to see like your childhood self through the eyes of your mother. Um, But yeah, music was always in me. I was always singing. I never knew it was really a a thing that was special. So I was never like, oh, I want to be a singer when I grow up. I was just kind of doing it. And it was, it just came naturally. Growing up, I was really interested in science. Mm. And I just, I liked school. I thought I wanted to like be a doctor or a nurse and I later did actually go into nursing school but what um what kind of clicked for me was piano Mm -hmm. piano was my actual first instrument and I took that on quite young I think but never really seriously until I was around 13 and I remembered I took lessons for a little bit And it never really went well because I would try to learn sheet music and it just like wouldn't really click. And then I would cheat and I would go listen to the song and then be able to play it. And so I think like at one point my teacher kind of caught on that I I, I was playing things so close to the sheet music, but like maybe in a different voicing. (laughs) And so she's like, wait, (laughs) it's technically right, but you're not actually doing this. So she found that out. And I didn't really care about that. I wanted to write my own stuff. So she tapered the learning towards that. So she would give me little learning assignments for writing. So she would be like, write a song in these two keys and like connect it in an artistic, tasteful way. And so that's, I did that for maybe a year at most. Um, But other than that, like I have no theory. I have no technical knowledge of music, really, especially on guitar. I never took lessons. I just taught myself. Um, But that came a little bit later when I was 16 or 17. I started playing guitar and I loved it. It felt like I kind of already knew it. It does feel like one of those things that was like a, I must have done in past life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Because I automatically kind of felt connected where I've seen other people pick up a guitar and they're like, whoa, this is really, like, what do I do with mm-hmm. my fingers? That's this me is with the weird. Guitar. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, you're such a great producer. You're like, you're a killer producer. I have to find, like, I use Ample Sound products all the time because they give me the most okay, yeah. realistic guitar sound in Ableton right or, or whatever software I'm using because I can find my way around the keys. But I'm a drummer at heart. Like, I used to be a session musician. But the 
the guitar is one of those things that my friend is a fabulous session guitarist and he, and he's left-handed so it's like double mental gymnastics if I grab his guitar. Oh, I'm just yeah. like, I have no idea what is going on. I think my hands are too small. So yeah, all all praise to you. I can't, I still can't figure it out. I was probably just like a trash man in a past life, I think. <laughs> I doubt it. You're definitely a drummer. Please, a drummer. Con- please continue. You're so always you're a drummer. <laughs> 16, 17, and now you're picking up the guitar. It's starting to come together. You're starting to write songs. Are you the only musical person in your family or not? In a sense, yes, but also no. We okay. all love music. Okay. Um, my sister, Maddie, who I'm really, really close with, actually was playing guitar first, and I remembered seeing her play. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, Maddie's so cool. I want to learn guitar. And then I... I, I learned at one point she didn't continue with it. Nobody in my family really continued music or like took it anywhere. We all have it in us. Mm. Um, and I, I believe that about everyone in the world. We all have the ability to be so creative because we are works of art ourselves, and it's just expressing who we are naturally. But uh, my mom plays piano she sang i'm pretty sure my dad played bass at some point wow and okay. maybe that's where i got my bass bug too because now i play bass and i love it uh i've always wanted to drum and i'm terrible at drumming okay drumming pending yeah drumming is definitely pending i need to get my like coordination down first that's so interesting i was saying on the last, last podcast for me drumming was the the thing that clicked because i was like i just have to hit something at the right time (laughs) and then that's how I could go back to piano and I was like okay I just have to hit Mm. these keys at the right time and then everything followed that in terms of production of like okay this piece goes here and we do it at this particular time but but for some reason I still can't apply apply that to the guitar but I'm I'm not gonna be beaten I will you know I'll come back (laughs) to you one day and be like I had I'm playing like smoke on the water (laughs) down 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 (laughs) Uh, what what year is this that the, uh, you're starting to find your guitar bug and your, your writing bug? Yeah, when I really started to find it. I mean, I started writing songs on the piano when I was maybe 13. Wow. I never started writing songs like lyrically, um, like a fully fledged song till after that. I do think I was like 16, 17. It was kind of in my high school age. Um, I I was raised in Portland. Mm-hmm. I was born in Canada and then raised in Portland and then moved back to Canada. And I started my musical journey in Portland. And thank God we moved to Portland because there's so much creativity there. Mm. There's so much going on. There's so many weird people. And yep. that sparks a lot of creativity. Uh, so that was a beautiful experience to trigger my musical journey journey and then moving back to Canada I was so bored really grade 10 I think I had my last two years of high school there and I was just so bored because it was a boring town it's a small town called Kelowna and um you know I love it there but living there as a teenager it's not that fun so Mm -hmm. all I did was music and again that was a massive blessing that I just had so much time to do music and I just dove into it. I wasn't totally social (laughs) as a kid. I was kind of a hermit, um, pretty introverted. I just wanted to do music. That was Mm -hmm. it. So I had a lot of time to focus and learn and be creative. And I think, um, I mean, talking about like the highlights and the lowlights, the type of envi- environment that I grew up as a child also was a catalyst for music because it gave me so many emotions. Right. Um, it was, you know, quite a hostile environment. I'll, 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 for the respect of my family, I'll kind of leave it there. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, there were definitely difficulties for sure that led to me turning to music as an outlet and a way of being able to express myself that was finally authentic and I could be free and just be really. So then I started writing things and I would lyrically write how I was feeling and I knew it wasn't there. I've always been quite hard on myself previously with music. Like 
at a young age, I was thinking I was supposed to be like Justin Bieber. You know, we always compare ourselves, right? Like where he was writing these songs that were like mm -hmm. hits at like 14. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right out of the gate. Yeah, we have no idea what's happening behind the scenes, you know. Um, but music totally got me through my childhood and my adulthood too. It's been been everything but particularly in those years the amount of music musicians that i've spoken to that have also used music uh as an outlet as an escape whether it be um boring town um you know where you grew up it's so funny that you mentioned as well that you were bored in canada because i have this discussion with that same friend that i mentioned to you i grew up around or in and around London. Mm -hmm. So people from overseas are like, that's great. You, you know, like there's New York, there's Paris, there's London. You're in that city lifestyle. And I'm like, no, it was boring. We were just trying to like stay out of the house. Mm. But I think about that for kids that grow up in holiday destinations. You know, the kids, there are, there are definitely children out there that grew up in Hawaii. And I'm like, what do the teenagers think? Are the and it's probably the same universally. They're just kind of wandering around with their friends and they're like, there is nothing to do here. I can't wait to go to, uh -huh. you know, X. So it's hilarious hearing <laughs> it again from you, someone that grew up in Canada, I've never visited and I can't mm. fathom, you know, what it's like to, to grow up in Canada, let alone visit. And then you're you know, you're like, oh, I came from Portland. I, was I mean, bored. Portland was so great. Portland right. was like, there was so much going on. But yeah, moving back to Canada, it is, I think it's like that for any kid, you know, you never really know what you have. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you're uprooting from your friends as well. Yeah, that was the thing too. That, yeah, I definitely found deeper connections in Portland. And then moving back to Canada was like, wait, I'm not really connecting with people as much here. But, yeah. you know, that was a blessing in disguise because that's how I got into music. Do you remember any of those first songs that you started writing as an escape? Did they ever make it to a release or were they just something that was in your mind in demo form? I think just in my mind and in demo form. When I was, um, when I was pretty little, I must have been around 12 or 13. Uh, the first thing that I started doing on my 12th birthday because of a gift that my father gave me. He gave me a little eight track Tascam recorder that uh, you just recorded it straight into the to, into the thing. It was, I mean, now we have an interface and all of the whole setup, but it was just the singular eight track recorder that I would plug in headphones and also plug in a mic. Yep. And I would just layer vocals so I was like kind of producing vocals mm -hmm, from like 12 mm -hmm. years old. That was the first thing I did. And it's funny because when I moved to London before that, I was kind of just all I did in the band that I was in at the start was I did my own vocals. And then we just sent him over to the producer. And so that kind of like stuck through that, you know, I, lo I love vocal production. That's one of my favorite parts of production. But yeah, as a kid, my dad gave me that gift. And I just dove into it. But all the songs were on that that Tascam 8-track recorder. I, I never, like, took them off of there. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I don't think I knew how to at that point. So a lot of them just either stayed there or, you know, in whatever the equivalent of the voice memos app would have been at that time, mm -hmm. whatever I was using. So, yeah, I, it was just an outlet for me. It was a hobby. I never really thought I would take it actually into being a career because that wasn't how my parents did it. That wasn't how anyone in my family did it. So that was uncharted territory that it wasn't really supported to go into music. Like it wasn't like, oh, you should do that. It's like, oh, I guess you could, <laughs> but it wasn't fully supported like going into, you know, any other kind of stable job was. And that band that you spoke of is that zoology or is that coming mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. where i first heard your name and mm. and you came onto my radar that was like i want to say 2016 on like the yeah majestic casual channels like i remember yeah. they were promoting your stuff um yeah and that was with i'm gonna mispronounce the name but i want to say like bo d 
Di- Diakowitz. Am I saying that right? Yeah, Bo Diakowitz. Yeah, that's it. Oh, Apparently, nice I mean that's that's how he says it. So okay, I'm sure right. that's it. Then that's how <laughs> I'm it. So yeah, that was yeah. 2016. How old are you in 2016 yes. then? I was 18. And you'd moved to London in that band or after that band? Tell me about those those couple of years. So that was kind of the first chapter of me doing music okay. fully. I kind of just stumbled into it really um, when I was in nursing school, actually, okay. in first year university. I was in Canada in nursing school and I loved it because I was helping people and that's something that I knew I always wanted to do. And I was going to say nursing school is a result of you, I'm assuming, correct me if I'm wrong, is a result of you thinking that you can't do music full time, right? So you're finding exactly. an alternative career in which you can yes. also help people. Yeah. And I don't even, I don't think it was consciously in my mind like, oh, I can't do music full time or I shouldn't do music full time. It was just... Hadn't considered it as an option. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just wasn't really considering it at that time. So it wasn't like off limits or something I didn't think I could do. Uh, it just wasn't really something I was doing. But I think during nursing school, I went through some of my first moments of, I guess you could call it depression. I guess I, I didn't really know what it was at that time. So I'm not sure how I labeled it, but something was off in my soul and something was not quite right. And I, I was, I I just was not aligned. So I was feeling that and again, turned to music as an outlet. So I dove into guitar and that's when I really started like actually connecting with the instrument in a certain wavelength that I had never really done it up until that point. Can you speak to that a little bit? How did it differ from how you were approaching writing or playing the guitar before? I was trying less. I was just allowing more. And I I wasn't trying to write something. I was just allowing the expression of what needed to be expressed to be expressed. And being, I guess, the vessel for whatever the universe wanted to come out, whatever that that needed to come out into the world, um, to come out. If you're so, listening to this episode, the chances are you're probably a musician or producer. And if you're looking to release your music, then there's never been a better time. With DistroKid, today's sponsor, you can upload your songs, EPs, and albums to all major streaming platforms. That's like Spotify, Amazon, Apple Music, and over 150 more. The best part, you keep 100% of your earnings. There's no middlemen and there's no hidden fees. Once signed up to DistroKid, you'll be able to make use of their promotional services too to make sure that your release is looking the most professional. I've pretty much used Hyperfollow, the landing page and promo cards with every release. And don't worry if you're still yet to master your songs, you can get access to Mixia through DistroKid, which helps you get a more dynamic, competitively loud mix in just a few clicks. Use the link in the description to get 7% off your first year and please enjoy the rest of the episode. So it was a more honest way and a more freeing way to approach music where I felt like I was always trying to get good at something. You know, I'm, I'm a Capricorn, so whatever I do, I want to do it to the fullest. I want to be successful, which is such a trap. Um, and I, I, yeah, I exited that trap thanks to you know, emotions and not feeling quite right. And I was writing a lot. And I remember that's when I kind of like started to be on social media. Right. But I wasn't really the type of person, like I didn't really care about social media that much. Um, So I was like, how do I use this to where it's actually, you know, authentic to who I am? And I thought, you know, I'm, I'm a musician, so I'll post music on there. And at this time, this was like 2015. I didn't follow anyone on Instagram except for my friends. I didn't really know that there was all of these music communities starting to grow on Instagram. So I would post like a little guitar video with like nothing on it. And somehow like these accounts on Instagram would repost it. And I remember sitting in nursing school in like one of these lectures and I just see like my phone notifications like going off and I was like, what's going on? This is like, this is a disturbance to the class. Like what's going on? I kind of just put my phone away and then I went back home and I just like saw a total influx in followers 
And I was like, what's going on? This is weird. And that was kind of like how I just stumbled into it, into music in general and like doing it as a career because that kind of kept happening. And then I found out that there was this whole community of guitarists and musicians in general on Instagram. And I was like, oh, this is so cool that this is here, like right at our fingertips. And I had no idea. And I kind of just got pushed into that community. And uh, someone in that community I saw and I started following and I thought he was so good. And that was Bo. And I remember like seeing him play and I just, I thought he was incredible and just had such taste where a lot of people just play guitar and they're just like trying to do cool things. And, and I, I, I saw him and I was like, oh, he's actually just so tasteful. And so we followed each other and we made a song together from opposite ends of the world. Mm. He was in London and I was in Canada and we wrote a song together and then we got an amazing producer named Tony, who was in Maryland at that time. And he produced it. So we were all, I was in Canada, Tony, Tony was in America, and Bo was in London. Wow. We made this song and just released it. We didn't have any other songs. We just had that one song, Escape, and we released it. And it did really quite well. And I remember one time we... Uh, looked at how it was doing and it was somehow on like the global viral charts on Spotify and we were like whoa holy shit and so I remember that was kind of the moment where I was like I'm just gonna quit school right. like fuck it I'm quitting nursing school even though I I'm good at it and I love it and I could have a solid career I need to do what is like what I'm meant to do here on earth. So I just followed that. And I, I think I was 17 when I went into university and then I turned 18 and I was able to apply for this, um, it's called the youth mobility scheme visa. And since Canada and the UK are Commonwealth, it's pretty easy for Canadians to just get a visa and move over. So I got a visa at 18 as a two year visa and I just moved to London. For most of the time, we were kind of, you know, hopping around. But yeah, that was what really kick-started it. And that was so great. You know, Bo and I had such, like, a musical chemistry that was really quite special. And, I mean, we dated, too. We were deeply in love. So I think that played a, a great factor into the musical chemistry and, you know, what people could hear and feel mm. our management who that management had found me somehow when I had released random demos on SoundCloud when right. I was like in nursing that I didn't think anyone really listened to like there was very little listens and that was fine to me I was just expressing myself you know it was my little outlet and they wanted to manage me and I told them at that time that I was going to pursue this band zoology and just do that full time. So they were managing us and they got us a deal with Majestic. Mm. So we were going to Berlin kind of here and there because Majestic was over there. And it was great. It was such fun times and it was such a great way to, you know, enter into, I guess, the music industry. It's so interesting because you are still finding your way in the world and it's so um polarizing it's such a different um way of life you know a different tempo from what you're used to you've gone from i assume quite a rigid quite um a stressful work schedule and now you're getting to pursue what will be or what is the dream but I know that you mentioned that you were having some hardships in your mental health and, and maybe a little bit of depression, whether you knew it by 18 or not. Mm -hmm. Does that dissipate or do you st are you still finding struggles in London? What does, what does the first, I don't know, six months to a year look like when, when you're in London? Great. You know, I was in love. Mm. We were both kind of, we both gave each other the opportunity to like really send in music and like okay. go towards it and like actually just creating music full time. So it was such a beautiful 
journey to start off with that I don't think I had noticed that that was there until we broke up and we broke up for various reasons and after that that was definitely very difficult so I experienced that again but I think again it was those moments of that kind of like sadness and emotion and difficulty that allowed me to find you know my frequency through the hardship and express that frequency and I do think that writing, I mean, you can write a song from any place. You can write a song from love and joy and happiness and feeling so good and it'll be amazing. And there's like, th th there's nothing better than writing just from however you're feeling and it just needs to be authentic. So writing from a place of hardship is obviously harder because we don't often want to face our emotions. We don't want to feel them. We don't want to go into them in order to express them, how they're dying to be expressed. Um, we usually just want to kind of like, ooh, I, I, I want to feel good. So I don't, I don't want to look at that. But that's, that's just not who I am as a person. So those moments of life were the most important moments for me. And those are always the moments of the most musical inspiration um, of just receival. I was just receiving from the universe when you break up are you trying to continue to make music together or are you you break up and then there's no more music together because i want to know what that looks like for mm. maybe the pressures of hearing from your fans the people that know zoology that are maybe waiting for mm. more music and perhaps you're having to address we broke up we're going in um you know, separate directions because as professionals, you both want to stay amicable, right? You don't want to blame the other person. What does what does that period look like? I think for us too, there is no way to blame each other. Right. There is nothing to blame each other for anything. We just weren't meant to be dating anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think we both kind of felt it was a little too hard to write music after that. Um, just, I, I think right after, you know, you hear about, the Fleetwood Max, that mm -hmm. they're all dating each other and then breaking each other's hearts and they're fucking each other and then breaking their hearts and, the, and they still write about everything through that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do think that's the ideal goal <laughs> to be able to just, you know, stay focused on the art. Tap into that. Yeah, yeah. And just, and, and use that energy as the fuel for the music. But, you know, that wasn't really possible for us at that time. Okay. So we, we just parted ways. And I think there was also something within myself that I wasn't yet ready to fully express while being in that relationship. I think because of people-pleasing tendencies, I didn't want to hurt the other person. So I, 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 I didn't allow myself to fully embody who I was as an artist. And I wasn't being fully authentic. And I think I knew that deep down. So it meant I had to just go my separate way and just write on my own mm. and just write what was really happening without worrying what the other person would think. And I, I think I was just young. You know, that was my first like real, real relationship. As you're an adult and you, you know, date and you find friction with new people and you find out how to work with someone when that comes to an end you have to tell yourself like okay i've been through this before i'm not gonna die i know you know right. maybe the, the ways to make myself feel better in a healthy way i know the things that i need mm -hmm. to focus on and how to to refocus but when it's that first love it cuts so deep because you're like i'm the only person that has ever experienced this type of heartbreak right yeah, yeah we totally think that mm. we're like oh no like this is the end of the world mm. when you've truly never experienced that the first time it happens it really does actually cut so deep because you're just, you just you have no idea what's that what that's like, mm -hmm. and yeah, you definitely do assume like oh my goodness, I'm the only one. So what does that transformation look like for you when I assume you move back to Canada or you move out of London? What does the transformation look like as you pursue music? Firstly, as just Emily Kruger, are you are you being your true self then, or or are you still? maybe hiding in the shadows a little bit. I actually remember I went to Berlin for a little bit after that. 
Uh, just because I loved it there. I think something about my, my actual roots are German, so something about there felt quite like home, but I was able to be alone still and just focus on music. So I went there for a little bit and it was really great. And I just kind of tapped into guitar, no pun intended. And I, yeah, I, I figured out what I wanted to say as a person again, as an artist, as someone who wasn't really worried about the other person in the relationship. Um, and my management continued to manage me and they told me that there was this producer in Nashville that was really great named Jamie. And I went on to work with him shortly after that. And I did my first like solo artist EP with him. And it was, it was really great. I felt really free. And I think after like so much heartbreak and, you know, it was really sad, all, everything that happened because I mean, we were both so fond of the project and of each other, so it was quite sad. Um, you know, getting back to yourself and remembering that you don't need anyone, you don't need anything, you don't need any situation to be um, perfect and whole and aligned. So that was that was great, kind of coming back into myself. And I wasn't necessarily really being me. I was writing what I thought would do well. Because when, after that, I was just like, okay, I just want to send it. I want to make a career out of this and I want to succeed. And to me, that looked like numbers. That looked like more streams. That looked like more listeners. And naturally, I wasn't you know, writing the most authentic music because that wasn't the most important thing to me at that time. So my focuses were elsewhere and that that's just how it was. And that's also okay to go through that and to have to go through that. So yeah, I mean, I, I still, I, I liked the music that I was doing, but I knew that something was missing and I didn't really know what was missing. And yeah, my management just like kept putting me in other rights with other artists or sorry producers that it wasn't really what I wanted it to sound like and at this time I wasn't really much of a producer but I was getting into production and I knew vaguely how to do some things but I had such a strong vision for what I wanted things to sound like and they often just it wouldn't get there you know so I think that whole time was kind of the experience of working with other people and writing with them and realizing that I wasn't yet strong enough in my writing abilities, in my songwriting abilities, or in just my authenticity and this in being able to express what I want to express without worrying what other people would think. So typically I would get in the room with these writers who were really great writers because I had a great management who would get me in good rooms. And it would often come out being more like them less like me, just because I, I wasn't, I mean, I was young. I wasn't sure enough of myself to be like, mm, that's not entirely me. I'd rather take it this way. So I came out with a lot of music that wasn't really, you know, it wasn't really showing like my essence. So it was good, but it wasn't great. And that kind of continued for a couple years and I would just release music here and there. And then I started to produce a little bit of my own stuff and I started releasing it, not really caring. That's kind of, I think in like 2019, 20, right before COVID. So I just kind of like stopped really caring about that whole success notion. And I was just like, fuck it, I'm just going to release my music and just release it for fun because I'm just making art. And, you know, I listen back to that stuff and I'm like, I love it because it was just it was just so that moment but you know it was definitely not as polished or anything because I, I was still like learning production and then COVID hit which at the time felt like such a low light but 
Honestly, for me as such like a hermit introvert, <laughs> I didn't really care. What was a yeah. bummer though was I couldn't like go to LA to work with the people that I was working with at that time or Nashville. So I was just forced back to Canada and that forcing mechanism for me to just focus and actually teach myself how to produce was the best thing that ever could have happened to me. Um, it was, it really allowed for the time where I could actually sit down on Ableton and I didn't have anything but time and I had the whole week and I knew it was going to be free. So I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to finish these two songs, these three songs, whatever it is. So many creatives spoke on the pandemic being kind of a blessing in disguise in that yeah. sense of you knew that every or most people were inside as well. In the UK, you were only allowed out. And at that first lockdown that we ever did, well, you were only allowed out for an hour at a time of a day. Mm -hmm. So it was like, I'm, every, everybody was just on their lab shit. They were just, what am I trying to grow? Do you remember how many like overnight bakers there were? Everybody was making sourdough. Really? Everybody got into oh sewing. Gosh. We all watched the same yeah. series on Netflix. Yeah. And then it was yeah, like, same after, after that first few weeks, we were like, well, what do I want to do? And then you started digging deep and going, well, what are the, the, the hobbies and the things that I have been putting off? What are the things that I've yeah. been saying I'm trying to get better at? And for mm -hmm. you, that was production. How do you go about, because I assume this kind of 2020, 2021 period is where you start to relearn who you are and how to find your voice. Is that correct? I don't even think I was really learning how to find my voice at this time right. because another, another, another low light, I guess. Again, there's, a, there's so many highlights and I, I, it's so hard to categorize. Absolutely. You know, a low light, I guess, was a relationship that I got into during COVID. No, not again. <laughs> not, not, not again. She did it again. <laughs> Where um, I gave away a lot of power, right. and you know, I was I was quite controlled, and it was with someone who was kind of insecure about me moving back to LA or like not really fully wanting to be in Canada. I, I was kind of forced to be there, so that was a factor in that, and that caused a lot of, you know, control, which again, allowed for my outlet of music. Um, but yeah, I had, I had the time to do production. So I was more so focused on the production side of things, because I think during this exact time, I, again, was not really allowing myself to express exactly how I felt as a human being with something really important to say. Um, so I, I, I wasn't focused on the songwriting. I wasn't focused on the artistry. I was just focused on the production. The technical skills. Which, which was beautiful, yes, for that time of life because it's, it's gotten me where I am now, where now I am a songwriter, an artist, and a producer. Mm -hmm. But I kind of focused on different things at different, different parts of my musical journey. But that was my production where I... I wasn't really writing anything true to myself, honest to myself, just focusing on, you know, the technical side, producing songs. And I would mainly build out a track in a day and then just leave it, not even really top line it, not do anything. I was like, okay, I did. I did, I did what I needed to do. And then on to the next. So I just had all these like random productions in the work. I'm at a crossroads as to where this topic should go because you've alluded to in this conversation and before we start recording spiritualism coming into your life but then also we're in this low light of maybe coming out of the pandemic and I assume you're wanting to leave Canada and go back to LA and that relationship is maybe going to take a turn so I want to give you the limelight and you direct us where you where you want maybe there's a crossover there um but, but yeah, that we've got spiritualism and we've got this, this relationship. What's the next chapter? <laughs> it's ironic that you say that because it actually was the crossroads for me okay. where it was, okay, I am at this point where I 
have never felt further away from my soul. And it doesn't even feel like I'm human anymore at this point. Um, I'm at this point where I stay right here, continue down this path, or I leave. And what brought me up to that, that point was months of allowing someone to kind of control me and to cage me where I stopped even saying anything that I wanted to say and I'm a quite emotional being as you can tell it's like it's you good. know it gets to me mm. but um that was probably one of the hardest times in my life and you hear people talk about things like oh don't do what your parents did. I was kind of doing what my what my mom did and what she allowed in her relationship for so long in a, in a in a much lighter way, <laughs> in a much more you know less harmful way. Okay. But um, it still had the same effect. So much to the to the point that I was so sad and I was so depressed. I remember sitting in the bathroom floor, suicidal. I wanted to kill myself and I wanted to end it. So that was my lowest of the low. And it was really dark. It was really, really dark. And now after it, I know exactly what took me there, why I went there. And it's really just not realizing my power as a human and being afraid of that power and not realizing that we're so perfect and we are so whole and we don't need anyone else. We don't need anything else around us, any, any perfect circumstance, because it was a very comfortable relationship. It was, I had all the creature comforts I needed, right? Which as, you know, any Capricorn would love. <laughs> but it, it was at the expense of, of my mental health. So I got to that point where I, I knew I just could not continue down that path of giving so much of myself away that I'm not receiving back that I have nothing even to say, you know, just being so depleted of all of my own energy. So that, like the darkest one of the darkest points in my life. There was another one that was really quite dark, but we can talk about that after. Um, that was when I feel like I awakened more than I had ever awakened in my life. And it was the moments of having so much darkness, yet still being able to see the light. And I think anyone who has been suicidal, who has contemplated their own life and taking it in its entirety there's still somehow a way to see the light and it's seemingly impossible in that moment but th the reason I knew that I was not going to do that was because I still saw that there was some positivity there was some light even though it was so dark I still saw that and I moved towards that and that was the catalyst for me to start being honest with my music, to start finally realizing like, whoa, there's something so subconscious here that I'm not wanting to, wanting to talk about. And of course, you know, our ego doesn't want that stuff to come up. It wants to keep us separate from everything. It wants to keep everything looking polished yeah, and clean. Keep it safe. It's scary. Yeah, for our ego, it's so, it's so scary to confront it mm. but that's all our soul wants for ourselves you know it, it, it wants the light to be shown on the darkness so that it can all just be light and that's that's the whole point of it um so yeah i remember being in at that point and it was about i think like four or five days after this or maybe maybe even closer maybe it was like two days after I got a message. Two days after the really dark period in the bathroom. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That I actually was in the hospital for a night. Mm. Um, just for, you know, mental health things. I didn't actually do anything to harm myself. 
but that was that was pretty dark for sure. But I got a message from uh, this production duo called Stargate. It was just a DM, just like asking me to go to their music program in LA. And I didn't really know what it was, but obviously I lit up because I was like, this is great. This mm -hmm. is an escape route mm -hmm. for me. So I, I remember Tor of Stargate, incredible producer. They're both incredible, Tor and Mikkel. Um, yeah, he messaged me and then we FaceTimed. We talked about this program. It was called LAMP, Los Angeles Academy of Artists and Music Producers. And he just wanted me to attend it. So I said, I would love to. So I went and um, I was there as a, as a producer because at this time I still wasn't you know, owning my artistry at that point. But again, it was another period of re-emerging and collaborating again with other individuals and writing with people and just expressing in a really free way in such like, in such a beautiful environment. You know, it was with probably like 45 other students and we were all there as either artists or writers or producers. And it was basically like a nine-month writing camp. Wow. Okay, that's quite and long. Yeah, it was a, it was amazing. Yeah. It, it's like a, it's a program, kind of like a school. You graduate with like a little plaque. And you're living with these people as well? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of us did. We just got our own apartments wow. outside of it. But Super cool. Yeah, it was really cool. And that was such a great opportunity for me to just get back to myself, focus on myself, not focus on relationships. And it was such a beautiful, beautiful environment where I wrote like probably hundreds of songs with people mm -hmm. and produced so much. And it was so good to be on like a timelet. Like we had a couple days to finish a song assignment. Sometimes it would be like finish the song in a day. And so it, it again, it honed in my skills. It honed in my production skills. Not only that, but just writing skills with other people. And the most beautiful part of the school was that as a producer, I realized I wanted to be an artist again because I was working with these artists. And sometimes I would be making the type of music that I would normally make with these artists. And I would find myself so bored and being like, oh, this feels monotonous or this is I don't really feel lit up doing this kind of stuff, even though it was what I was making prior. Like it was like a cool pop R&B track, but I was just like, hmm, I can see like when I'm not the artist, I don't really feel super lit up. Whereas I would work with some other artists doing something else. And I was like, ooh, this is really fun, but this is also something that I kind of wish I was doing as an artist. So it allowed me to find my sound as an artist and to realize what I wanted to say. Because when you're working with other people and when you're co-writing with other people, you're always writing a song from your perspective. They're writing the song from their perspective. And you might be writing from an entirely different place, but you're writing the same thing. And I would find that I would always write these songs from a particular place that I wouldn't really write if I would have been the artist. And so that, led me to picking a different artist name because I realized that there's something about having a mask that allows you to truly express yourself. Because Can you explain that a little bit? I don't think we need a mask to fully express ourselves. We definitely don't. But for some people that can be very helpful because if you have kind of like like an artist name or something that you're, you're stepping into and that is that mask, it's you're just able to express more fully and more authentically versus if you feel so exposed without that mask. It, it actually ironically allows more vulnerability to, you know, give the song the, the truth that it deserves. Because you have that safety so, buffer. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So I think having that kind of mask and that like persona to step into allows actually the real me to come through. So I realized, what if I changed my artist name and had this whole persona to step into that 
was not just a persona, it was like my higher self. That my artist project, who that person is, is who I want to be and who I'm becoming. Because we're always in a state of becoming. We're never really, we're never really there. We're never like arrived. As people, we're always evolving. We're always growing and learning. And, you know, we're always on some journey somewhere. And I think this is the part of the journey where, yeah, as an artist, I'm just stepping into who I actually am. And it's a lot more, it, it's, it's focused on things that actually matter, things that are deeper and things that are maybe a little darker at times. Um, so yeah, naturally, I mean, the name of the project that is coming out is called Death, Sex, and Inheritance, which is seemingly heavy, very, very heavy. Um, and it's all things that feel, you know, maybe taboo to talk about. No one really likes to talk about death. It's pretty taboo to talk about sex. Not really in music. I mean, everybody's talking about that. But in the, it, there's a certain way to talk about it that not a lot of people talk about it. And inheritance, no one really wants to talk about that. But mm. I'm not talking about death, sex, and inheritance in the way that you think I'm talking about it. I'm talking about death as something really beautiful, and it's a transformation that is a segue into a whole new life, a whole new beginning, because death doesn't even really exist. And sex is just the emergence of you and your soul and your highest good and you and something that you are becoming like. So this whole album is like a love story between me and my highest self. Obviously inspired by me and my husband, but in reality, I see it as a love story between me and my highest self. And the inheritance part is not at all about money or anything. It's about what we're given from our parents. You know, you might have your father's eyes and your mother's smile, and you might have your mother's people ten people pleasing tendencies and your father's anger or something. I don't know. We all get something from our parents. And we are inherited these personality traits and this particular set of circumstances that we choose what to do with. So the inheritance is what we choose to do with what we're given and how we choose to grow and choose to evolve. And now you're flourishing. We get to the modern day. You're about to release an EP, which we'll speak about in just a moment. You're releasing new music. You have a new alias. Is it a slow burn? Is it something that other people notice? Hey, this new music isn't what we've heard before, or is it something very conscious? It's interesting because it started with a little eureka moment that then was a slow burn. And okay. I think even at this point, it's still a slow burn. Mm. You know, life naturally is nothing. I mean, things can happen so quickly, but that quick happening just triggers a longer amount of growth. And that takes time. So it's all a slow burn. But there was definitely a eureka moment where... I, I was living in Santa Monica at this time, and I was just single, and I was loving life, and I was going through one of the largest spiritual awakenings that I had ever experienced. Um, what led to that? I remember there was this one day where I was outside, and I was just so grateful, and I had like such a flood of gratitude and I had a psychedelic experience just naturally. Okay. And it was like, it was, and I noticed after the fact, like, whoa, this was triggered just from a moment of deep, deep gratitude and just acceptance for everything in life. And, you know, I think m many things led up to that, you know, meditation and just practicing life and loving and living consciously, okay. you know, like in, in a more mindful way, I think choosing to treat people 
in a more mindful way that, I mean, I've never like treated people like poorly, mm. but I think just being extra cautious to just treat that stranger with so much kindness. Mm. How can I cheer somebody up today? How can I go out of my mm. way to bring a mm. smile to somebody else? Exactly. And I think, you know, working at LAMP with so many people, I realized that the most important thing to me wasn't even really the music. It was the community mm. and like being there for everyone and, you know, getting in those vulnerable spaces when you're writing those vulnerable songs and being the person to like try to provide light in that situation. So I think that really, that just led to so much personal growth to, yeah, acceptance of all of these experiences that I had gone through. Um, yeah, so I, I remember like walking down the street and just feeling so much gratitude and having this really interesting, like almost psychedelic experience where I like had all these smells and okay. I was like, these beautiful smells are not even like, where is this coming from? <laughs> I am outside and like, yeah, there's palm trees around, but there's not even a lot of flowers. And I knew it was like the presence of God or the presence of my angels or something. So I had this experience. And during this time, I started writing things so differently, like so, so differently. Can you give an example of the before and after of, of writing? Yeah, yeah. The One of the first songs that I wrote that is going to be on this project called Stereo Minds, um, it was after this experience. And I just, I had no idea even like where this song came from because it was so it was so different for me and this was in this was in the winter of i think like 2022 going like right going into 2023 it was in the winter and it was such an amazing song but i had no idea where it came from i was like oh this is not like anything i've ever made it was like it felt incredibly psychedelic and it was a lot more like rock and it felt like a song that was like straight out of like the 70s and i was like where did this come from this is so cool again i didn't know in this moment but it was a conversation between me and my highest self do you have a theory or a guideline that you can share with us of how you stay on that true honest path of who you are is it a space that you get into when you're writing or is it just mindfulness, meditation and daily habits? I think my theory is relevant to, to myself, but I think every, I believe every soul comes here with a very specific checklist of things that they need to do in order to evolve and that they may have a very different set of circumstances that may look like a five-year process for someone and may look like a 10-day process for someone else. And I think my theory to allow the most honest, true music to come out of you is just trust the process and, and surrender to the challenges and the difficulties and the setbacks because there are times of life where we are meant to awaken and we're meant to see things behind the veil and get that inspiration and there are times of moments times of life where we just need to rest and we need to heal and we need to stop trying and maybe we need to sleep and we need to be asleep and that's okay for that moment of life too and I think if you just allow what's going on in your life to occur and to try to see the beauty in it, that's what makes you creative because it's that moment of darkness, of uncertainty, of fear, where you see the light and you manifest the change and create something beautiful out of it. So I think it's just, it's, it's not shying away from 
the depths. We're not supposed to shy away from the darkness. We're supposed to find the light in the darkness and make it all light. And I think that, you know, we all have such different paths and there's no right or wrong. You know, some people are consciously writing the music. Some, some people are subconsciously writing the music and that's, that's all perfect. That's all exactly as it should be. Wow. And your new project, Death, Sex and Inheritance. Remind us of the artist's name. Yeah, it's Velvetica. Is that going to be an entirely new entity that people search separately? Or are the Emily Kruger pages going to merge into this one new body of art? Everything will stay the name except for will stay the same except for Spotify. Mm -hmm. I'll keep my same Instagram, but just change the handle. Mm -hmm. And yeah, socials all across will be like that. So Emily Kruger will effectively not exist. She has effectively died. Oh my goodness. And uh, you'll still be able to find her on Spotify. She still lives on there. And Velvetica will be new on Spotify and, you know, birthed. Wow, that is so exciting. We've had a few lowlights in this episode, which have birthed so many highlights for you. Mm -hmm. What does the modern day look like for Velvetica? Mm, life for Velvetica. Velvetica is hella witchy. Ooh. She's like, she's super witchy. She's super tapped in. She is, um, you know, she's, she's one with everything. You know, this is this is the per persona that I I step into, and mm. um, you know, a lot of experiences kind of formed Velvetica, specifically, you know, like plant medicine and the death that occurs during those experiences. So that's that's definitely alongside Velvetica. She um. Yeah, she she's soft but but edgy at the same time. Kind of like the name is, you know. I loved the word velvet and the word velvet kept coming up, but it's it's something that's so soft and like elegant, but it's still edgy. Where if mm -hmm. you rub it the wrong way, it's it's a little bit edgy. For sure, for sure. Um so it's like psychedelic rock with kind of like ethereal soul melodies. Um, so all of those vibes are Velvetica. And yeah, she was she was birthed from all the lowlights and all 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 of the highlights too, you know. I think the first song that I wrote in this project, Stereo Minds, was kind of the manifestation of what was to come. And it's it's really, really quite divine how this specific song um did actually manifest in my own life right like so much beauty and so much joy you know i was i was in this time of life where i was single and just so happy to be single and me and i i was kind of at the point where i was like you know what this could be for forever and i love it like i i just i don't need anyone i don't necessarily even want anyone i'm not i'm not closed i just i had an open heart to everything and everything was just perfect and i met someone at this point who i was kind of like honestly at the start fine if i met him fine if i didn't meet him we met on a dating app and i was just kind of like i don't really like need to date all that much so like whatever but I met him and it was definitely like I guess one of those like love at first sight feelings really which I had never experienced in my life and I I, I did not love him at first sight you know he's a great looking person but that's beside the fact it was just like I felt so much energy in the sense of knowing that like something was very important wow and I realized that this song that I wrote prior, Stereo Minds, and it was like this love song between me and my highest self, where it was literally my soul talking to my ego. It was pretty much kind of like the whole relationship that was about to be set out 
with my now husband. Mm. And it was so cool that I was able to see in retrospect how you really do manifest what you write. <laughs> so like, kinda, I don't want to say like be careful because it instills fear, but like be careful what you write because it really will manifest. Sure. If you if you actually want to put that in, out into the universe. If you believe it. Yeah, and I think it was kind of just me being one with myself and who I was supposed to be and being okay with just being me, ironically allowed for such a perfect love to manifest in my life with my now husband. And yeah, it was seeing all of the, all of the unhealed wounds and childhood traumas that I was replaying in prior relationships and seeing that and learning to love it and accepting that that had happened and not having shame and not like fearing that really because we 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 tend to just fear all of the darkness that we've seen but it's it's not supposed to be like that you know that that's how you end up replaying it but yeah it was kind of through that song and then when I met this person I wrote this other song called Telepathic Baddie, which is going to be the first single. And yeah, it's it was just, you know, you think you get in a relationship with someone else, but you're not. You get in a relationship with yourself. So are you the telepathic baddie? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I actually, I actually wrote this song <laughs> from, I, I wrote the song after... A meditation that during the meditation <laughs> I felt like I had this conversation with Ross my husband and at the time my my partner and we had conversations after which it was like I realized it was like our souls having these conversations in like another dimension which is absolutely fucking psychotic and crazy did but you I tell him about it straight thing. after I did and what was his reaction? We, we've, I mean, he was like, whoa, I don't think he was aware of anything happening in that moment, but we've definitely had these moments where we know we can like read each other's mind. And so it's kind of the song about that. And yeah, it's really great because that was, that was the song that kind of, you know, conceived our love story and preceded our whole entire love story. But before that, more importantly, before I even met him, before anything, it was the love story with myself and that in my higher self and that is the whole that's the whole project weaved through the inspiration of my husband and you know what what love should be where it's 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 free it's not controlling and it's you're just allowed to do what you want to do and you're pushed to do what you want to do you know now he's my manager and we have this shared vision and there's 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 nothing separate about that it's amazing when you get to have those reflective moments that are like aha you know we said earlier when you experience that first heartbreak you can't tell me that the world isn't ending you know yeah and then you finally get to that grown-up relationship where you go oh this is what true love is supposed to look and feel like it is exciting at times but it's not the roller coaster velocity movie stuff and it's not mm -hmm. a horrible place that makes you feel small it's normally somewhere in the middle that just makes you feel comfortable it makes you feel like home it makes you feel calm and you're like oh this is real love it's not as um as, as, as built up to be as exciting as it is in the movies and the books yeah. and stuff and i'm so excited for this new chapter in your life when we've spoken throughout this episode about some of the lowlights, some of the highlights, old projects, old hard times I've seen you light up about some moments and, and, and seem to be crushed by others. And I can tell that you're genuinely excited about this project. Yeah. The new project is Velvetica, Death, Sex and Inheritance. And when can people yeah. expect that? They can expect that in the fall. Um, yeah, like I said, the first single is going to be July 17th, and I'm going to release singles probably a month apart from each other. We'll see how it goes, but I'm assuming that, and then probably November will be the full EP, 
but it's done and it is getting mixed by the most incredible mix engineer, Mike Seberg, and being mastered by the most incredible master engineer, Jack Kennedy. And they're both just absolutely slaying. They're doing so good. And it's it's really coming together so well. Velvetica, <laughs> Emily Kruger, thank you so much for your time today and sitting down with us and having this conversation. Yes. I'm going to let you go, but I hope you have a beautiful rest of your day. And I really look forward to this new project, this new chapter in your life. Yes, I can't wait to share it. And thank you for talking. It was so, so lovely. All the best. Okay, see you. We did it. <laughs> lovely, we did it. Woo! -hoo.